Welcome everybody to yet another Take Back Control Tuesday. And I wanna thank you all for joining us. Now, I can't tell you what the outcome is gonna be for each of you, but what I can tell you is what you're about to learn absolutely can change your financial future. If you're here, you're probably ready for change. And what you're gonna learn and the insights you're gonna take out of this will help you get there. So if the prospect of taking back control of your money isn't enough to keep you glued to this screen right here for the next 90 minutes, then I think we really need to reassess our priorities. And tonight we have an extra special guest, Mr. Carson Hurling. And you know, there's an interesting story. I met Carson through his dad. His dad's been a dear friend of mine and his father was the first person I ever heard on stage say this. He said, the ultimate in real estate is being the bank. And now the legacy passes on and you're gonna hear from Carson, you're gonna hear about how this has changed his life, but not just his life, his young family's life. So let me just give you a quick overview of what you're gonna learn. There's essentially three basic things you're gonna learn from tonight. Number one, you're gonna learn how to take back control of your money by being the bank. Number two, you're gonna learn how to build wealth through your own debts and expenses, and it's not gonna require you working harder, working longer, or taking on any additional risks. And number three, you're gonna learn how to get all the money back for every single car you will ever buy, drive, and own. If that's not enough to keep you here, well then, you're riding a bicycle home. All right, so that's enough from me. Let's dive in. Take back control. Tuesday. Tuesday? Hello, everybody. Let's get it, guys. I'm excited to meet with you all today. Uh, I haven't been on here for, I don't know, maybe a month or so. It's been a while I've presented with everybody. So I'm excited to do so. Some of you probably know who I am. Some of you might not. I'll give you a quick intro in the beginning. But let's dive into what we are discussing today, which is infinite banking, obviously. Hey guys, I, I want to go through a lot of things today. I'll probably be on the screen for maybe 45 minutes. I'll try and keep it even less than that. We're going to talk infinite banking. We're going to talk how you can control your money and be the bank. And there's going to be a lot of questions that pop up as we go through this. A lot of numbers and examples I explain that you guys are going to need explanation on. I understand that. I want you to have questions. I want you to keep them in mind. So please if you're on here today, stay very involved, interactive, write your questions in the chat, write them down. I'm going to keep in mind everything we're going through here. So at the end of this, when we do go through questions and answers, you're going to be a lot more prepared and know, you know the questions you want to go through. And, and that's if your questions don't get answered as we go through this. As you all see on the screen, we're going to talk about the money multiplier method, how we can map out the millionaire mystery. A lot of alliteration here with all the M's, right? Mapping Out the Millionaire Mystery is a book Chris Noggle wrote about, obviously, this strategy. So those of you, I see someone's at work. I love it. I think there's always people who are out. You know, it's the middle of Tuesday. So for you guys to spend your time here today is obviously amazing. Whether you're at work, out, you know, stores with your family, kids, dropping kids off, whatever it is, thanks for being here. But let's let's dive into this. So, you know, most... Most of Americans, we spend most of our adult life paying the banks, paying the creditors, paying our expenses. And at the same time, we're watching our retirement accounts and our legacy fluctuate and evaporate in the markets. We've been taught to give up control of our finances. We've been taught to assume risk on our end, and it's costing us financial freedom. You know, the wealthiest people, they know differently. They do differently. And what I want to talk about today is a 200-year-old strategy that's been used by the wealthiest families in history to eliminate their debt, to minimize their taxes, and to leave a legacy. And I'm going to show you guys how to do all of that just like they did without taking on any more risk, without working any harder, without changing your cash flow, and without losing control over your finances. This presentation today is going to show you guys, really show you, how you can become the bank, like I mentioned. So let's dive into this. I'm going to have a lot of questions for you all throughout this entire presentation, a ton. Please let me know your thoughts. Answer these questions via the chat. That's what the chat is here for. Ask your questions, respond to questions, You know, be enthusiastic. I want to have the best webinar that Chris has ever seen right here today. 
And that all comes down to you guys. The more you guys put into this, the more you're going to get of it. So first question for you, we'll do a little test here, is how many of you guys at one point or another in your life did not have control over your money of any sort? Have you ever felt that or experienced that throughout this entire 20, 30 years, 50 years? How many of you at one point or another have been looking for ways to control your money? And that's maybe even why you're here today. You're looking for ways to better control what's going on, right? Someone said never thought about it. Well, good for you for never worrying about money. Maybe this is going to be really exciting to you, an eye opener, or maybe it's going to be annoying and you might want to get off, which is fine. You know, you do you, but I'm excited for you to be here and maybe show you something different. So well, I, what I want to take you on today is a journey. And first on this journey, I want to congratulate you guys and welcome you guys for being here. And I really mean that because there's so many people out there that just yap. They just talk. They claim that they want to be better. They claim they're doing whatever, but they're not here. 99% of people saw an ad or a YouTube video or the idea to come learn about money and they chose not to be here for whatever reason. And some will watch this replay and that will be great for them. They, they may not be able to be here right now, but most people are not choosing to learn. And the thing that you and I and we all here today have in common is that we are here. We're taking the time, our energy, our efforts to learn. And so those of you listening, me and you, like we, we, we truly want to have wealth. So great job for being here. Now, whenever I walk into a, you know, a room where I'm speaking or I come on a webinar like this, I always think to myself, what am I going to get out of, out of this? What am I going to learn today? And so that's what I want to start with for you guys to just tell you right up front what we're going to talk about. And I have four things for you we're going to talk about. The first thing is protection. Because who doesn't want to protect the hard-earned money we're making? And the second is going to be tax-free growth. Because there's smarter money moves we can be making that we're not taught to do. Third being leverage. Because there are so many opportunities, dollars, tools, money coming in in the future that we need to be leveraging further. And last is legacy. Because you guys aren't here today to just teach yourself, but you're here to learn something to then provide a legacy for your family, your friends, your community, teaching this and passing this knowledge down and on to others. So I have a system that will help you accomplish all of these things. If you could take home a blueprint from me with all of these things, would that be worth our time together today? Everyone in the chat, what? yes, no, what do you think? So I guess someone said they worry about scams. Let's, let's talk about scams. Let's talk about it today. Just for you guys to have a little bit of confidence in me being your speaker today, I'd love to just share real quickly who I am, what I do, why I'm here. So. I'll show you a couple pictures real quick. This is my wife and I, Anna. We live in Southern California. And over the past few years, we have built a foundation for our, our, you know, our young family to not just be rich, but to build generational wealth. And I can sum this experience up with two words. First being gratitude, second being choices. I am so grateful that I get to just feel secure and confident in my future financial future specifically. But more than that, I'm, I'm so grateful for the opportunities that I've been given. I've had so many mentors in my life already guiding me in the right direction from the start of my career. And choices, because I get to choose every single day what I do. If I wanted to go to Europe next week with Anna, we could get up and go and be completely fine. We have freedom and control over not just our money, but that's bled into our personal life. And it's amazing. And my story is pretty simple. I know you know, a lot of you actually might relate to it because in my early years, I made a lot of mistakes as we all do when we're young. But I did one thing right. At 18 years old, I went and served a, a church mission where I lived abroad for a year. And when I came home, I was in school. I was in college. and I had all these different outside influences pushing me different directions. In one hand, I held a traditional route and mindset. I was going to school learning about math, English, economics. You know, this route was really grooming me to be good at tasks and a good employee and kind of going down the corporate America rate, uh, route. But in this hand, I was surrounding myself with entrepreneurs, real estate investors. Really, I saw the freedom and control that they had in their lives. And I came to a point where I had to decide, do I want to work for money, a part of the so-called rat race, or do I want to learn how to make money work for me? And it was that tension pulling these two things apart and brought me to a point of decision. 
And that decision was to drop out of school and pursue an education in investing and start making money work for me, which I like to call the wealth game. And this completely changed the course of my life. But above all, most important to me is my wife and my family. And most of you guys would like to have, well, actually, I'll ask this in a, in a question form. How many of you guys would like to have enough money to spend as much time with your family as you wanted? Yeah. Yeah, 100%. I agree with you, Michael. So, And I always get this one too, but how many of you guys would like to make more money to spend less time with your families? When I do that in person, there's always some people that raise their hands and I'm I'm, I'm impressed with their boldness to go out and say that in front of everybody. But it's, it's, it's true. Everyone's different. But what I'm going to talk about today is what you want. So let's start with statistics. Start with some numbers really quickly. Let's talk about the 5%. You guys on this training today are what I call the 5%. You're a part of this because you're here on the webinar. And that's amazing. Genuinely, you know, pat yourselves on the back. But if I was to go around right now and ask 118 year olds and I ask them, would you guys be wealthy and successful by the age of 65? What do you think they'd say? I could almost guarantee you before I even finish the statement, they're saying, of course, there's no way I would not be a yes, I'll be financially successful at 65. I have so much time. They'd be all excited about it. But something happens from age 18 to 65 that changes everything, changes the whole dynamic. And you know what it is? Actually, the, the, the Social Security Administration came out with this stat. They said five out of 100 people will be financially secure at retirement age. Think about that. Not just ri not, 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 not rich, not wealthy, not happy, just secure. That means 95% of us are going to be working until we're 70. 80, taking on two jobs, not because we want to, but because we have to, because we didn't make the right decisions when we, when we were younger. And we followed the traditional path that obviously doesn't work if only 5% of people succeed doing it. So before you guys get discouraged and, and start worrying about your future, I want you guys to know something that, that today, that's all going to change. The biggest difference between you guys and that and that 95% that, that, that don't do this is that you guys are willing to invest your time, your money, your energy, your efforts into learning something new. And I, if you really stay here with me today, you stick to this, you learn this and you try and implement it, you will not be that 95%. You will be 100% those 5% of people. So let's dive into some serious 5% stuff today, guys. Let's start with this question. And I'll ask you guys, why aren't more people successful? Frank's already ahead of the game. He already knows. Life happens. 100% laziness, mindset. All the above, 100% agreed. So what are these different... Man, you guys are crushing it. You're, these are great. These two things. There are set mind killer or wealth killers. I guess you can call it mind killers. And mindset problems. You know, when you go in out, you, when you go out and work hard for your money that comes in, and then what? You pay taxes on it. And then it has to fight inflation, has to fight volatility eventually hopefully maybe it gets to where you want it to be and then despite all of that people choose to follow the status quo fear gets involved they pull things out they spend money when they don't need to life gets in the way and they are forced to spend money when they can't they're forced to dive into their savings with these six things it is almost impossible to become successful and that's why only five percent of americans can even do it in a you know just securely not even in a grand way so let's let's talk about what most people are doing and why. And I, it always comes back to this quote for me, Will Rogers. He said, the problem in America isn't so much what people don't know, because we know a lot. It's about what people think they know. That just ain't so. A lot of what we've been taught to do with money may not actually be the truth. So I need you guys to keep an open mind throughout this webinar, because I'm going to challenge the way you think about money. So let's start with a little bit of an experiment. You guys ever heard of this before, the backward bicycle experiment? Those of you who have been here before, you have. And we talk about this all the time because it is very important. When you guys were little, you probably learned how to ride a bike, right? Very easy. It's muscle memory now. You get on the bike, you take a couple pedals, you go forward, you turn the handlebars right, you go right, turn it left, you go left, super easy, right? What would happen if I told you the bike didn't work that way? What would happen if you turned the handlebars right and the bike went left? You turn the handlebars left and the bike went right. Well, that's what this experiment was. You look this up on YouTube. This guy wanted to find out if he could ride a bike backwards. So he does. Turns the handlebars around. He gets up on the bike, takes a couple pedals, and immediately falls. Thinking, that's weird. He knows how to ride a bike. He gets back up, takes a couple pedals, falls again. 
does that over and over and over again for hours on end. He could not figure out how to ride a bike, even though he knew his whole life how to. He always did it. And, and eventually he got it. But then he tried to switch back to a normal bike and he couldn't do it again. It took him hours to re- reboot his mind to go back to how it was before. So very interesting experiment. But I share this with you guys because when you learn something one way, it's very hard to change. And the same is true with money. Since we were little, we've been trained how to think about money. But what would happen if I told you that what you were taught is wrong? It'd be very difficult to change to the new way of thinking, wouldn't it? It it wouldn't be impossible. It wouldn't because people do it all the time. But you would need to learn how to ride the bike backwards, just like this guy did. And so earlier I mentioned, well, someone else in the chat actually mentioned this. They said they're worried about scams or is this too good to be true? You know, how is this 200 year old concept still relevant today? And what do we do when we hear something's too good to be true? If we don't understand it, we walk away from it. We ignore it. We disregard it. Well, we we can't be doing that. Because what I'm going to talk about today has been taught by a lot of individuals. In this book by Robert Kiyosaki, Second Chance, he talks all about why he does this. In this other book here by Mr. Tony Robbins, you all know him, Tony Robbins, right? He talks all about this strategy in section 5.2 of his book. And actually, the, you know, the, the oldest families in, the, in America, the Rockefellers, the Rothschild, the Stanleys, the Morgans, Ray Kroc, Walt Disney. Guys, I'll, I'll get to them in a second, but they all incorporated this too. And this book right here by Nelson Nash, Becoming Your Own Banker, this is the foundational book to learn this strategy. And then these two books at the bottom by Mr. Chris Noggle. You guys know him. You're here because of him. He wrote his two books teaching this strategy as well. Now, what are the mysteries of money? What are some things that get in the way? Well, let's start with what money is. What, what's the definition, guys? You guys all know it, especially if you've been here before. Tess, always here. I love seeing your name in there, Tess. Glad you're here. Money is a performance. Steve, I don't know if I've heard that one before, but that's very interesting. I maybe expand on that. Well, what's the defini- definition of money? Money is just a means of exchange. I don't know what what you meant there by by Steve performance, but it, it's a means of exchange. That, I mean, that's it. You trade money for food, food for money. Money for car, car for money. Money for house, house for money. I mean, it's a means of exchange. What if I was to ask you guys another question? What about compound interest? Have you guys all heard of it before? What companies or businesses use compound interest? What would you guys say as well? Banks. There it is. Way of exchange, legal definition, banks, yeah, 100%. So the most common answer is actually banks. So that's funny. That's the very first one. It, it always is. Let's focus on banks. So people think banks make compound interest, but they do not. Banks charge you compound interest, but they don't use it themselves. Because, for example, if if you were to go into Wells Fargo right now, deposit a $20 bill, and, and put it in you know your little box or vault in the back of the office, is that what they do? Or do they take your $20 bill and then they immediately lend it out somewhere else? That money immediately goes into motion. It's lent out. There isn't a business in the world that uses compound interest and nor do banks. Banks keep money in motion like you should do. Just haven't been shown or taught why or how to do that. Because if I had this question for you next, what would you what would you think? Are dollars worth more today or in the future? You'd probably tell me dollars are worth way more today or at least I'd hope you'd think so, than they are in the future. Think about how many candy bars you could have bought for $1 20 years ago versus how many candy bars you could buy today. You probably couldn't even buy one. What about taxes? Are taxes going to go up or are they going to go down? Guys, you know, they're always going to go up. And if they don't go up, they're just going to find more stuff to tax us on anyways. So wouldn't it be making more sense to pay tax on the seed of our money and not the harvest? Of course. However, most of us don't practice what we preach. We don't do that because chances are most of you have a 401k or some employee sponsored plan. And what you're actually doing is when you put those dollars in the 401k, you're giving up today's dollar, which is the most valuable dollar in exchange for weaker dollars in the future. You're compounding the tax because the tax is always going to be there. And when you pay the tax on that money someday later, you're going to pay on an even larger amount. So you're not paying tax on the seed. You're paying tax on the harvest you're paying tax on dollars that are worth less too. And the funny thing is, is people have been taught to just give up control of their money. And like, that's a good thing. 
But as you see, that's not. We, we literally have been taught to do things with money that we would never, ever do with things that money buys. Because, for example, what if, let's say you go to a grocery store right now. You walk down to the grocery store. You get a loaf of bread. You come home. You open up the freezer. You throw it in the freezer. And then you wait five, 10, 15 years. You come back, open up the freezer. You pull out your loaf of bread, and you're ready to eat it. Would you do that? Definitely not. Your, your bread would be freezer burned. You'd never actually eat it. What about a car? What, what if you went and just got a brand new truck, you bring it home, you park it in the driveway, you're stoked about it, and then you wait 5, 10, 15 years, and then you come back, you get back in the car, open up the door, and you expect to drive the car. You would never, ever do that. You would never do that with, with food, a car, anything you buy. So why do we do that with money? We've been, again, taught to give up control of our good dollars today for weaker dollars in the future. And people say all the time, well, hey, I get a match in my 401k, so it's it's worth double. Well, sure. But if you came home and, and had two loaves of bread that were in the freezer instead of one, you still wouldn't eat either of them. They still would both be bad. I'll, I'll give you guys real examples in the future with numbers to explain that. But people don't know anything about their retirement accounts. I bet you if you do have a retirement account, I can tell you what you know. You probably saw your last statement and you saw whether it went up or down. And you probably saw whether it was in a low, median, or, or high risk tolerance. That's about it. So, so how is that control? How is that building wealth? That is just gambling. We need to understand how money actually works. So let's dive into that. How does money move? Well, another question for you guys. Do you think it's possible to make more money earning 4% while paying 6%? Do you think that's possible? No, right? Well, 6% plus, well, minus 6% from your four, that's negative two. Simple math. Well, it's actually not true. You could make more earning four while paying six, and I'll prove it to you right now. Might not make sense. Six minus four is two, right? Doesn't, doesn't work, but I'll show you how it does. Let's say you have a car you're going to purchase. You're going to buy a car for $25,000. You also have $25,000 sitting in your current checking account. And you think, well, should I take the 25K out of my checking account and just buy the car cash? Or you could take a loan for the car at 25 and leave your 25 sitting in the savings account. So let's just give the example of you have a great savings account. They pay you 4% on your savings account and the bank will offer you a $25,000 loan at 6%. Well, you do those numbers. 60 months, five-year car, no five car note at 6%, you're 25 grand. You will pay $483 every single month for your car, which is a whole lot, right? That would mean you'd spend about 29 grand over that five-year period on your car, okay? So that's, that's one option. But if you left your 25 sitting in your savings account earning 4% for 60 months, you do that math, your future value will be 30,500. Now, how is that possible to earn more on four while paying six? Well, it's simple. They're different interests. Your savings account is compounding interest on itself. So every single year, it's compounding on more and more going up and up. While your 25K car gets paid down, paid down, less interest, less interest, lower and lower, and it's eventually exceeding it. In the first year, I'm sure, yeah, you paid more interest on the car, but over a five-year note, you will make way more by letting your money sit there and compound at four. Even with the 6% note, it could be a 7% note and you'd probably still make more. So this is just to break your mind up a little bit of how money actually works. You can make more earning for while paying six and I do it every single year. So if you do this math, that's 1500 bucks you would have made just so you guys know. Pretty cool. So let's talk about what we're gonna dive into today. All of this has been laying the foundation for what we're actually gonna discuss today, which is the money multiplier method, the way to be the bank, infinite banking, whatever term you wanna use. I think there are three things that are involved here when you are trying to accomplish this method. There is one, the machine. There's a place your money constantly runs through you need to understand. The second is the marathon. Because guys, getting rich is not a sprint. If you think it's a sprint, you're not gonna succeed. It takes a really, really long time. This is a, gonna take a few years to even build this system out fully. So again, one, the machines where your money is flowing to the marathon is that this just takes time. And last being the millionaire. This could be anything for you, multimillionaire, business owner, whatever your goal is, whatever you're trying to do, have more time freedom, 
Your goal is a hefty part of this strategy. So real quick, if you guys do need to leave early, here, I'm gonna throw my email in the chat. You can reach out to me for this whole presentation. I will, uh, I will send it to you if you guys need to go. I'm, I, again, I'm not here to sell anything. I just wanna share knowledge with you guys. And, but we can have a conversation later. We can talk more in depth one-on-one -on -one about your questions and how this could work for you. So if you do wanna do that, we have to head out. Please reach out to me. I'll throw my email on the chat here. This begs a question for me. If we're gonna talk about the machine, what is the machine we're gonna run your money through? Where can we be storing our funds where we're in control, we're the bank? That's the question, right? So I often ask myself this question. Could it be possible that there are more efficient environments to store wealth outside of commercial banks we're not aware of? Really think about this for a second. Are there more efficient environments? That should be a yes for most of us thinking about this. Now, I don't think I'll ever get to a point in my life where I know everything there is to know about money, and that's fine. But this is a powerful question because I want to think about what we're not already thinking about, what we haven't been taught to think about. And when it comes to money, I, I really like to keep a humble and learner mentality throughout my life. And I hope you guys do the same. But if you guys have read any of those, those books about money, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, Tony Robbins, Money Master the Game, the basic money books, what do they all teach? One of the main rules they say is save money. Most people say save 10% of your income. If you're able to save 10% of your income already, you're already ahead of most people around you. Most people today save around 5% of their income, which is just simply not enough to survive or grow or build anything nowadays. So if you're not saving at least 10% of your income, you need to be doing that. Uh, find ways to do that first. But that's the number one rule in most of these books. And so in our American culture, I think that savings rate's going down and we don't really value savings anymore because the place we've been told to store our savings is not efficient. It is not a great place to store funds because they tell us to put it in commercial banks. These environments like savings accounts, high yield savings accounts, 401ks, they are so incredibly inefficient that it's hard to save money because the money that we place in those environments don't do anything. They don't move. You don't see any growth from it. So you pull it out and use it. It's just not enough. So what we're going to talk about today is what efficient environment that we can be running our funds through? What's the machine our money runs through? What's your bank? And what we're gonna talk about today is that function of your life called banking. This is a paradigm shift for people when they start learning about this because everything we do is banking, whether we understand it, see it, like it or not. Banking affects every single component of our life. So wouldn't it be smart to learn a little bit about banking and how that actually applies to our life financially? So what is your bank? Let's just, let's just start there. Whenever you guys, let's say you need to buy something or take a loan for something, wouldn't you rather do that from your bank compared to somebody else's? If this was going to be a place that's going to replace your current account at somebody else's bank, wouldn't we want everything coming to and from us going to our bank versus somewhere else's, somebody else's? And what if your bank had amazing benefits? What if this machine your money ran through was incredibly efficient? What would make a place to store money efficient, guys? What are the top qualities or attributes you want your storage of wealth to have? I can almost guarantee you, whatever you want your money to be sitting at doing is going to be inside of your bank. First off, they're both liquid. Most important, to build wealth, to be the bank, to finance things, to take loans, to invest, you need liquidity. That is in your bank. Second, don't we all want it to grow? Traditional savings accounts right now, the average savings account pays 0.07% annually. I'm sure there's some high yield accounts that do well, but they're not going to do well much longer. The average is 0.07. What if I could tell you your bank was earning 2 to 6% guaranteed, uninterrupted, and compounding? If you don't understand what those words mean in terms of compound interest, it's, it's impactful. I would I urge you to learn more. What about tax-free. What, what if your account grew tax-free and was never taxed, whereas your bank, even the 0.07% you make is taxed? What about protection? What if you were ever in a lawsuit, judgment, lien, the market crashes, banks, your money sitting in a savings account could be taken or seized at any point. What if money in your bank was completely protected? And banks fail all of the time, as we saw through COVID. Dozens of banks went bankrupt. What if I could tell you your bank would never go bankrupt? Ever, ever, ever. Now, wouldn't this be a more efficient place to store money? 
This would be a place you could control, you could count on, you could use as the foundation to finance everything throughout your life. And our lives are chaotic. I, I mean, whether you're a business owner, you know, you have multiple jobs, juggling a lot in your life, life's chaotic. So the opportunity to actually put money somewhere that's still liquid so you can still use it when those chaotic times come up, but it's also going to compound guaranteed interest. That's going to be completely risk-free for the market and the world. And what if I was to add to all of these attributes here, that if you did take money out of your bank, you took the liquidity out, it would actually not stop the dollars from compounding interest. I need to hear that again. That is something that everyone should dive deeper into. Guys, wouldn't you agree that this is a much more efficient place to store money than really anything else? Well, let's find out what your bank is. You guys are going to laugh. The machine we use to do this is none other than good old there you go. Dividend paying whole life insurance from a mutual company. Now, guys, don't leave. Don't go to the bathroom. Don't think I'm here to sell life insurance. You do not understand what I'm about to teach you. Let me explain. Why whole life insurance, you may ask? Well, because that's what rich people do. That's what the elite do. That's how those families I mentioned earlier built extreme generational wealth. You can use whole life insurance way different than you think you can. And this is not just regular old whole life off the shelf your broke brother-in-law sells at, at State Farm. This is very, very specifically designed whole life insurance. And again, we're here to talk about banking. I'm not here to sell you a product or an investment because the policy is none of those things. It is a banking process. Our money flows through the machine, through the policy. Does not mean the policy is a one-stop shop, not a retirement, not a place to earn interest. It is a place our money flows through. Okay, I'll explain this further. Who does this? If you don't believe me, I never invented this. I didn't do this again. This is a 200-year-old strategy. Who did this? Top left, Mr. John Rockefeller. Probably one of the biggest family, I don't even know what to explain, empire America's ever seen. He built his empire through whole life. Walt Disney on the top right started Disneyland with this strategy. These two billionaires on the bottom right, Buffett, Gates, they have reportedly over a billion dollars in whole life insurance. Bottom left, two presidential candidates. I actually should probably change this presentation now because it's no, no, no longer Biden. But when Biden became president four years ago, if you look at his financial statements because it came public to everybody. His financial statements showed four whole life insurance policies. Trump and his family do it too. So whether, it, again, this has been around for years and decades this is something that older individuals have been using to protect and build their wealth. And this is something people today are still doing. So why? Why are we not taught to do this? And you know what's even crazier than all this? Guess who the number one purchasers of whole life insurance in the world is? Banks. Traditional banks. Look this up. Write this down. Bully. Bank-owned life insurance. You will find, if you look this up, that banks own more whole life insurance, not IULs, not universal life, not VULs, not term insurance, whole life than they own in land and buildings combined. Banks are the number one purchasers of these whole life insurance policies in the world, okay? Not only do they own more whole life insurance, banks are continuing to buy more every single year. So you need to ask yourself, are banks stupid or do they know something that I don't know? Between these four banks, the big four banks, they have over $60 billion in whole life. Guys, they're not stupid. They're smarter than I am, smarter than you are. We just need to mimic them. We're going to do what they do. So how do banks work? Let's talk about it. If you had, let's just say you had 100 grand you wanted to leave in a bank somewhere. This was your, your safekeeping. And you find a bank that pays you 4% again. Fantastic bank. You love it. You're stoked 4% you're happy with. Awesome. You leave it there. You deposit it. Now, once that money is deposited, guys, the banks don't like keeping your money there because the money to them sitting there is a liability. They need to go make that money work for them to produce income. So they take it out and they go invest it into real assets. So for example, let's say they take your 100 and go give it to a buddy down the street who's going to buy a house. Buy a house for 7%. So when they close on the house, the bank lends the money, they pay the seller, they close on the house, and then where does the seller put their returns? Back in the bank. Interesting, All right? Well, then what does the bank do again? They lend it out somewhere else. They lend it to somebody else on a car note at 8%. 
And then what do they do when they buy the car? They pay the car dealership who puts their money where again, guys, back in the bank. Who's going to then, then lend it out at a higher percentage on a home remodel loan because they're in second position on the house. It's going to be a little bit higher of an interest rate. And they're going to pay the contractor on that loan. Who's going to put their money where? And lastly, let's say the contractor goes and gets a huge, you know, they blow it on, on red at, at, in Vegas. They get a debt consolidation when they pay off a bunch of credit cards. The credit cards, where do the companies put their money? Back in the bank. So look at this chart really quickly. Dive into this. Sink this in. Who is in control of all of these transactions? Not you, the bank. Well, you are making four. They were making seven on your dollars. They were making 3% more than you on your money. When you were making four, they were also making eight. They were making 4% more than you. When you were making four, they were making nine. They were making 5% more than you. And then they were making 8% more than you here. So total all of those up. They're making 20% more than you. Keyword more than you. Guys, how much more money are they making than you on your money? If you're making four and they're making 20, doesn't four go into 25 times? So does that mean they're making five times what you make? They're making 500% on your money every single year. Welcome to what banks really do. How much risk did the bank take on all of these transactions? Very little. They're in first position. You default on a car, home, they take it. How much money did they make? A whole lot. A lot of money, no risk on your dollars. This is why we don't save money. It doesn't help us, it helps them. This is why you go to any you know downtown corner lot in any big city in the country who has those largest best properties always the banks because we're paying them to do it you look this up on bauerfinancial.com bauerfinancial.com you can find any annual report for the past 20 years from banks and you will find that banks make between 400 and 1300 percent on the money you leave there that is a real report from every single bank in the country guys when i told you that banks are the number one purchasers of these specially designed whole life policies. The thing I asked was, are the banks stupid or do they know something you don't know? You now know they are not stupid. They know something we don't know. And not only that, banks understand what we do with our money. So how can we be like the bank? Well, I'm going to give you a real life example now. Finally, those of you who are numbers people, analytical people, we're going to get to the good stuff here. All of this has been leading up to the numbers. This will really solidify what we're doing. I want to show you guys how you can get all the interest back for any car, any truck, any boat you ever buy, drive, and own. This is just a cool truck I found online. This is not mine. I wish it was. But I'm going to share with you guys how you could buy a truck or a car and get all the money back for it. Because you are the bank. You're the one in control. You're the one earning. And how do we do that? Well, we flow our money through our bank instead of somebody else's. And guys, again, what is our bank? Dividend paying, specially designed, whole life insurance from a mutual company. So let's talk about this machine here. That chart on the right is an example of a policy. I do not want you to focus on this quite yet. I'm going to dive deep into these numbers in like two minutes. I want to lay down the, the foundation here. So when people think about life insurance, they think of premium. And we really need to change our mindsets around this and life insurance in general, because that is not at all how we treat this, not at all what this is. Premium is a bill to most people, just like your home insurance premium, your health insurance, your car insurance. It's a bill, which I understand it is. But this is different. If you can, can correctly design a policy, this becomes more like a deposit, no longer a premium, because deposit. But when you go deposit money at your bank, your, your actual bank, don't you, you know, a deposit feels good. A deposit's nice. It's money going to your account. It's liquid for you to access. Who doesn't want to deposit more money in their bank? Everyone wants to deposit the most they can. So if your policy was structured correctly, it can be exactly that. It can be a deposit that's immediately available and liquid. So we need to start changing the way we think about premium. We need to think about it as a deposit. So from now on, I'm going to refer to premium as a deposit. Now, I say this all the time, and people will even call me and say, oh, this $10,000 a year premium seems way too high. Well, do you save ten grand a year? Yeah, I save way more than that. Well, why wouldn't you want to save that in your bank, not somebody else's? This is a deposit, not a payment. Change your mindset, okay? Age is another question people ask about. Well, hey, I'm 55. Hey, I'm 60. Hey, I'm 45. I'm, am I getting too old to get whole life insurance? No, not at all. See, age does not matter. 
because I'm going to tell the insurance company how much premium you want. We're going to help you design how much income we're flowing through this. If you're older, the death benefit's going to be less than a younger person. But again, we're not building this for a death benefit. We're building this to be a bank. So yes, the death benefit is on the policy. Death benefit is involved. But we care more about the cash value, the liquidity, what we can access, the growth of it. We don't care as much about the death benefit. But you will find that the more money you run through this, the more you are your own bank, the more things you finance through it, the bigger the death benefit will end up being in the end anyways. Your family is going to be left with more. Hence the term family banking. Okay. So these three things we can go through real quickly. Well, let's talk about the policy and how we're going to buy a car. So real numbers here. Let's say you have a policy the first seven years of it. You deposit 10 grand a year, 10 grand every year, your payments, your premiums, your deposits, right? Farthest right column is what's called cash value. So those of you who are not familiar with life insurance, you pay a premium into the policy that pays for a death benefit. The insurance company says, great, now you have this policy. You can access your equity inside of the policy. And that equity you tap into is actually called cash value. You can access this cash value whenever you want, take it out whenever you want, pay back however you want. It is a loan from the insurance company using your policy as collateral. So your 10 grand sits here, earns interest, tax-free, protected against lawsuits, judgments, liens, the market crashing. Just like I explained earlier when I said, what does your bank hold? That's what your bank holds. You pay 10 grand into your policy, it gets all of those benefits and the death benefit. And while it's sitting here with all these benefits, your money's growing, safe, death benefit. It is still liquid and you can take a loan against the policy via the cash value. And also remember, you could be earning more at 4% while you pay an interest at 6% on a loan. I show that example for you guys because that's exactly what you could do here with the policy. You could be earning more while taking loans against it and financing things you need, which is exactly what we're going to show you here. So in the third year, let's take $25,000 as a loan against our cash value and go buy a car, cash. So we do that. 25 comes out, we go buy a car cash. If you see the cash value on year number three drops to four grand, the reason it does is because we take 25 out, just so you're aware. But if we're going to take a loan from ourselves, don't we want to treat ourselves the same way we would treat a, you know, a traditional bank, right? If I'm going to take 25 grand as a loan, wasn't the payment earlier about 500 bucks a month? So I'm going to keep making that payment of 500 bucks a month, six grand a year for 60 months, six or five years. So let's, let's tally this up here. You paid 70 as premiums. You paid 30 into it, repaying the loan. So you deposited a hundred grand into this policy over seven years. It's a whole lot, you might think, right? hundred grand. You also took out 25 as a loan to buy the car. So we'll subtract that. That's not really involved in what you put in. That's what you took out. So your net injection into this policy is $75,000 over seven years. But look at your cash value at year number seven. It's 67 grand. 67,881. That would mean you get 91 cents back on every dollar you put into this. You put in 75, you had access to 91% of it, 67 grand. And you bought a car. You could also say, I got 91 cents back on the car I just purchased, right? You put in 75, you have access to 67. You're only, you're only out seven, eight grand, we'll call it. You could also say your car was only worth seven, eight grand. But this is short term thinking. Let's look long term even further. Let's say in the eighth year, you want to take another loan to go buy another car. Let's also say you don't want to pay any more premium into it, which you can do. After seven years, no more premium. You take 25 as a loan against your current cash value in year number eight. And what do we do when we take a loan? Pay ourselves back with interest. 500 bucks a month as if we were paying any other bank. Same numbers. So you'll have paid $0 as premiums. You've paid 30K back to the policy. You also took 25 grand out to buy the car. So your net injection over that five-year period is five grand. But look at how much the cash value increased by. Look at your seven to 12. Cash value grows from 67 grand all the way to 91 grand. It grows by $23,000 and you put in just five and have a car fully paid for. You made 23 grand off of buying a car. This is your first time hearing this. This part usually messes with your mind a little bit. 
I'm giving you a second to think about it. Let's look at the whole scenario. Over 12 years, your cash value is 91 grand, right? Over those 12 years, you put in 75 in the first seven years. You put in five in the next five years. So you put in $80,000 in here and you have 91 left over. You made $11,000 off of buying two cars and storing your money in life insurance versus a traditional bank. How is this possible? Well, because all of the dollars you put in the policy are earning interest. Then you're taking a loan against it to go buy the car. Which remember in the very beginning, I showed you the example. If you took a loan at 6% and we're, and we're making 4%, that compounding interest will exceed the depreciating interest you owe on the loan and you will make more money over time. Now imagine giving that 12 years and two loans you took against your policy. Your policy grows a lot. So you will make money off of buying two cars. And this is just a purchase. You could do the same example for all kinds of stuff. Boats, houses, investments, taxes, vacations, tuition. And we'll dive into that. But look at this for a second. There's a lot of numbers going on here. There's three three rules, sorry, I use or I, I try and implement when I do this. First rule, pay myself first. I'm putting $10,000 a year aside into my policy. We've been trained to pay our bills first and then take whatever's left over and put that into savings, but that's the wrong way of thinking. We pay ourselves first, meaning we put our as much income as we can into a savings vehicle first, and then we pay our bills. The policy is that savings vehicle. This is the machine your money runs through. So you pay yourself first. Rule number two is you take if you take a loan from yourself, you pay yourself back how you'd pay anybody back. You be honest with yourself. And rule number three, recapture and recycle the interest. Because if you're paying yourself back the interest, you're recapturing it. Wouldn't you rather have the interest be paid to you versus somebody else? Duh, right? And if this works for a car, what else does it work for? Everything. You can literally be your own bank because you can finance everything you ever need from here on out through your own banking system, okay? Let's give you another example. And those of you in the, in the chat here, I see you guys are chatting a lot in here still. If you guys are starting to get questions, you guys have to head out. I just threw my email in the chat. Please email me your questions, thoughts, if you want the replay sent to you. If you guys need to head out, there's my email address. All right, we're going to keep going here. So another example, what if you had debt? We had somebody come to us years ago and they said, hey, you know, I'm 45 years old. I have nine different debts. It's a lot, but I'm a chiropractor. I make good money. How can I pay all this stuff off and pay myself back? How can I be the bank? So he showed us his debts. Some of you might relate to this. He had four credit cards, a private loan, a BMW, a, a boat loan, a condo, and a house. All kinds of debt. He had 500 grand of total debt almost. He was paying about 5,700 bucks a month, 69 grand a year going towards debt. Now imagine if he could save 69 grand a year and invest it and not pay it to other people. Boom, that's a game changer. Do that same math for you. What if your total debt was 50 grand, but you could save 500 bucks a month? It is the exact same situation as this, just proportionately larger. So don't get overwhelmed by these numbers. It was just a, a really good case study. So he came to us and said, hey, it's going to take me 19 years to pay all this off. <laughs> so we thought, okay, well, let's get rid of this much quicker. We can do this way more efficiently. He also said, hey, I, I, I save about two grand a month right now with my business. I, it kind of comes in as cash to put it aside, but I'd love to use that and save that more efficiently. I'd like to save that in my bank, not somebody else's. So instead of him using his extra income, two grand a month, and paying all of his debt down, he chose to put that two grand a month in his bank, his policy, first paying himself first, remember rule number one, and then once it's here, he then uses that money in the most efficient way he can, which is to pay down the debt in this scenario. So he does. Year number one, he deposits 25 grand into the policy, about two grand a month. And year one, his cash value was 14 grand. He only had access to about 60% of his funds in the first year. If you remember in the car example, they also had about access to 60% of their funds in the first year. Again, this process takes time to build. We could build a policy where you have access to more cash value earlier and sooner. So we can talk about that in a personal phone call. But this situation, they had access to 60% of their funds, which they take this 14 grand, they pay off the two lowest credit cards and the Nordstrom card. So a couple of debts gone right off the bat. Now, what's he gonna do if he takes a loan from himself? pay himself 
back with interest. So if he was paying $161 a month on his Discover card at 20% and $287 a month on his lowest card at 11%, he's going to keep making those payments, okay? He's just going to keep making those payments back to himself now. He's going to pay himself those payments. So $448 a month now is going to go to him. $5,329 is going to go to the, the debt still. So he does this again every single month for the next year. Your number two rolls around. He deposits 25 grand into the policy again. His cash value is more than last year. It's 16 grand this year. So he has access to a little bit more because remember, he's earning interest in his policy. So he has access to more and more every year. And he paid himself back $448 a month. So his payments he repaid himself was about 5,370. So he had access to 21,900 in the second year to now use to pay off his debt. Takes out that 21K from his policy, pays off all three of those debts. Which remember, look at those three payments. What's he gonna do now? Pay himself back. So look at how much he can save. He's now saving $1,900 a month and he's still paying 3,800 a month on his, on his debt. So he has 1,900 a month he can use to start paying himself back. So your number three rolls around. He deposits 25 grand into it. His cash value increases by 25 grand again, too. He's earning more and more in his policy every year. He has access to $23,000 because he paid himself back 1,900 bucks a month. Sorry. So the total cash available in this third year is 48. And he chooses to pay down these two loans. Guys, we're three years in and he's almost debt free. Okay. Minus the two biggest ones, which will take some time. But for the sake of, of, of him taking 19 years to pay off all his debt, Look at how fast this is compared to that. And we are doing the snowball debt pay down method, if you've heard of that. So that also helps. Now, three years in, payments now he's making your 2,100 bucks a month just for those two loans and he's saving 3,600 bucks a month. Let's take a quick overview. We talked about this being a marathon. We talked about this taking time. Well, how much did we put in over those first three years? 25 in year one, 25 in year two, 25 in year three for a total of 75. How much did we take out as loans? Well, we took out 14K from the policy, then 16, then about 25. We took about took out about 55. Well, how much is left in your policy after three years? Is it 20 grand? 75 you put in minus the 55 loans? No, because remember, your money was never touched. Your 75 you deposited in the policy are still sitting there earning interest, still compounding, still there for you. You are saving for yourself forever and you took a loan against it to go pay down your debt. Now this 75K is going to earn interest for the next 50 years of your life. Do that math. 75K is 6% a year for 50 years. That is hundreds of thousands of dollars that you will earn on that money. Again, remember, he could have just paid his debt down directly and not put it through a policy, which would have been great. But he would have lost it. He would have spent it. It would have been gone. In this scenario, he kept 75 grand and that 75 grand is now working, earning for him forever, okay? Let's go back to this. Your number four, deposits 25 in. Cash value grows by 26. He, he pays himself back 3,600 bucks a month. That is 44 grand. His total cash available is 70,000. He throws it on the condo. That's now down to 26. Year five, same thing. Here we go. Pays down the condo in full. All that's left is the house, okay? All that's left is the house, okay? Five years in the insurance company actually came to him and said, hey, you are not able to put any more premium into this at, at 25 grand a year. We need to lower the premium because you've been putting so much into it. This is called the MEC rules. It's an IRS tax law and insurance policies. We can dive into this during the Q&As. But he had to drop his premium down to 10 grand a year after that. He also came to us and said, hey, my business is doing better. I'm able to save another two grand a month. So he set up a second policy, a second branch office to his family bank. Just like Wells Fargo has multiple branch offices everywhere. He set up multiple too. So he deposits 10 grand into the first, deposits 25 grand into the second, and his cash value is available in both policies. He also paid himself back every month, 4,500 a month, because he no longer has those debts, but he's still paying himself back. And so he now has 82 grand to easily pay off the house plus extra. And there you go, six years. And he is debt free. It did not take him 19 like we originally thought. Pretty cool, right? So what if you don't have debt? What if you don't need a new car? Could you still benefit from privatized banking? Could you still want to become your own bank? Well, heck yeah, you do. It just gets fun. If you don't have debt, you don't have to pay other people. Now you can go and invest. Now you can go buy real estate. Now you can build your wealth. It just gets way funner from there. And that's the path I'm on.
I have no debt now. I don't need a new car now. I am using all of my income, running it to life insurance, and then buying rent properties. And it is a never-ending game of just buying more assets and building wealth. And the longer you have to do this, the faster you can do this, the better it'll be for you. Your real estate business lives and dies by the network and the connections that you make. I mean, after all, your network, well, it's your net worth. That's what you always heard, right? If that's an area where you desire improvement, well, Private Money Club, it's for you. PMC saves you precious time and money by bringing the real estate world, well, right to you, right in the palm of your hand. So get in on the action like so many others have by going to privatemoneyclub.com and sign up. A lot of people say the best time to start this system was 20 years ago. The next best time is today. You don't need to wait for some magical thing to happen to take action. That's why you're here. You chose to be here to take action. That's what we're going to talk about today is how you can then implement this yourself. So let's let's go back to the, the, the example of him paying off his condo and house real quickly. What if he chose to keep paying himself back what those house payments were for the life of the loans? Well, he paid off his condo with 251 months left over still, but it would have taken him to pay off the condo and 224 months left on the house. If you make that payment all those years, he would have paid a total of about 500 grand to the banks. Now, because he financed it himself and he's gonna pay himself back, he's going to pay himself back $500,000 over the next you know, 20, 20, 250 months or whatever it is. How cool is that? Not only is he paying less interest, he's paying more, well, paying less interest to the banks, he's paying it back to himself. So by using this method, you now have that money in your account rather than the banker's account. Now that you know this, now that you know this is possible, everybody should be doing this. And in my opinion, you are not just hurting yourself. You are stealing from your kids and your grandkids if you do not do this. I believe you know, that no matter what you make, $10 an hour, $100,000 an hour, I don't care what it is, this can work for anybody. Yes, there's some qualifications to get life insurance and we have to build a policy very specific, but this can work for anybody. And think about it. Wealthy people do this for a reason because they know what it can do and they all understand how to keep money in the family. We all need to break the bonds that we have that's called financial slavery. We've got to break these bonds because if we don't, we're going to continue being stuck. You're going to continue being in debt and not having the success or the wealth that you really want. And you'll become like the 95% that's not financially secure at retirement age. When you do this, again, you're not just setting yourself up, but you're setting up your kids and your grandkids. So today we talked about infinite banking, which is, which is this strategy. And this strategy is all about controlling your money, controlling where everything's going in and out of a place you can control. So let's wrap up today with some other aspects of how infinite banking works and what other things we did not cover that are involved here. So here you go. Your policy grows tax-free. We kind of already hit that. The death benefit is tax-free as well. So even if you were extremely wealthy and you were finding ways to protect your money, well, your biggest enemy is taxes. When you passed away, all your estate's going to get taxed going down to the next generation. And so if you could use a death benefit tax-free to then supplement some of the taxes you would owe, there you go. That could be a play for you too. Again, policies are safe. You could use a policy to live off of for retirement if you would like. You could set up policies on kids. You could fund colleges. You could fund your own business. You could do all kinds of stuff. And how do you fund a policy? How do you fund your own bank? Any frequency you want. I would say at the bare minimum, if you are not able to save 10 times your age a month, this is not for you yet. Find a way to start saving more money. 10 times your age a month is the bare minimum I recommend. 10 times your age a month, let's say you're 50 years old, at a zero, that would be $500 a month. The maximum you can do is dependent upon the individual and the individual's net worth. But we have seen people put millions and millions of dollars into policies just fine. So it depends on you. On top of a premium deposit, let's say you're 500 or 50 years old doing 500 bucks a month, you could also dump, let's just say 20 grand into the policy up front to get it started. You could do a large deposit. You don't have to, but you can. Let's say you have 20 grand sitting in your current savings account or a 401k or an emergency fund. You can dump that in here and it'll still be liquid. It'll still be available, but now it's in a more efficient environment. So you definitely can do that and should do that. And you'll have access to 60 to 90% of the deposit premiums that you make within the first 30 days. So it's very quick. And we call these specially designed policies high early cash value policies. These allow you to become the bank very fast. 
Let's hit really quick what policy loans are and how they operate. Policy loans, you take a loan from your policy, it is guaranteed. You can take it out whenever you want, as many loans as you want. Have it out as long as you want. It is a loan against yourself. You are in complete control. And the policy loan is the same thing as cash value. You're taking a loan against your cash value. Interchangeable words. It's the same thing. So don't get confused. Okay. I look at these policy loans like a line of credit. If you have a line of credit at the bank and you choose to pay it back, whatever you pay back becomes liquid and available for you to use again. Same thing as the policy. It's just refilling the line of credit, basically. Also, if you take a loan, there's no credit checks, no approval. You just ask for a loan, they send it to you. And these loans are private. They don't go on your credit report. So let's say you have all kinds of credit cards and a HELOC and a mortgage, and you're trying, and you want to qualify for some other house or something, and your DTI looks way too high. You could just have your policy pay off all those small third-party debts, free up your DTI, free up your cash flow even too. Now you could qualify for a loan because loans on your policy are Write it. Uh, actually, no, I should hit this really quickly. I was just looking at a text that I just got. I should mention this. So you're most likely, and don't get this confused, you will keep your bank account. You will keep a checking account at Wells Fargo or Chase or your regional bank. You're probably going to continue getting mortgages with the bank for a while. But the goal here is to minimize how much you need that, minimize how much you store there, and maximize how much you can finance through a policy. So over time, as you build the policy up, you can eventually finance everything through it. But again, that just takes time. So our mission is to get to that point as soon as possible, start running everything through it over time. And eventually it'll be big enough for you to have your own private banking system. There are no minimums, no maximums on your loans. You can pay it back how you'd like. If you had a car note with the bank and you, and you didn't pay on your car note, they could come and seize your car. That can't happen with a policy because you're taking a loan from yourself. You're in control. It's a loan against you. You choose what you do if you miss the payment. Again, nothing happens. You're paying yourself back on a, on a term you set for yourself. So, I mean, you have complete control. People often ask me, why the money multiplier, Carson? Well, first off, guys, I personally will teach you how to implement this strategy completely free of charge. I know that's a buzzword, free. My team and I do not charge anything. There's no fees, no costs, no management, anything. Because... We're paid from the insurance companies for the business that we bring them. So we, do, we are paid. We don't do this for free. Of course not. But we're taken care of in that way. And so I'm never going to manage your policy. I'm never going to invest your funds. I'm not paying down your debt. You're doing this all on your own. We're just going to be a third party to help make sure you set this up right and you use it correctly. And I personally met with over 2,000 families across the country showing them how to build this strategy out. And between my whole team, We've met with over 20,000 families across the country. So we know how people think about money. We know what people are doing. And we are teaching them to be their own bank and get away from the corporate and you know traditional banks. One more thing I'll say here. A lot of people bring this up. This gets a lot of attention. People say, well, can you do an infinite banking policy with an IUL or a VUL or term? The answer is no. You cannot use any other financial product besides whole life to do banking. You, I mean, I guess you could, but the most efficient environment and the most efficient product to use is whole life. Not that anything else is bad or wrong. It's just not meant and it has a different purpose than banking itself. So I don't want to get to that. I'll, I'll finish up here. I know we've been going for a while. So real quick, the end here, only one of two things are going to happen to us. We're going to live or we're going to die. I say that so quickly and, and uh, nonchalantly. It, it, I should say it with more emphasis because we all are going to die someday. And are we better off with or without this while we're alive? Guys, I just showed you examples of how to buy cars and get money back on it, how to pay off debt in a quicker time and pay yourself back, how you can multiply your investments. Of course, you're better off with this than without. Again, this policy is not the, policy is not the magic pill. The policy is not going to change your life. The policy is not an investment. It's just a much more efficient place to run money through so you can be the bank. You can finance things yourself. And yes, you're better off with this than without. And what if you passed away? Well, if something did happen to you, your family would get only what's sitting in your bank account today. If you had a policy, they would get a death benefit. They'd get a multiple of what you have. So they're better off if you have this than if you don't have it. And lastly, and with the wise words from the best investor of all time, Warren Buffett said, if poor people would just do what rich people did, they would no longer be poor. They'd be poor no more. Guys, you know what Berkshire Hathaway is, the company Buffett owns? He actually has an insurance company division. Why do you think he does that? Guys, I know I gave you so many examples of 
the wealthiest families in history is doing it. The banks doing this, the corporations doing this. If we just simply did what they did, we would not be poor anymore. We would not have a poor mindset even. So everybody in the chat, let's start livening the chat up again. We're gonna get to some Q and A's. How many of you could see yourself doing this and implementing this as they have? What do you guys think? Here's the thing. I'm going to give you guys an opportunity. If you guys pull out your cell phone, if you're watching on your cell phone, pull up this link. If, you don't, if you're on a computer, pull up your cell phone, pull up your camera and put your camera up to the screen. You can click this link here right now. This will send you directly to my calendar. That link, carson.beyourownbanker.com, will as well send you directly to my calendar. I would gladly meet with every single one of you for free and see if this makes sense for you. Even just hop on a phone call and answer your questions about this. Because guys, I know we talked about it for an hour. An hour is not enough for you to learn this deeply. You need hours on hours to be around this strategy to fully grasp it. So don't think that, you know, today is the day for you to, you know, whatever. I mean, you need time to learn this. And so let's have a conversation. Let's do more due diligence. Let's send you more resources and books and, you know, videos and, and examples for you to learn from. So you're ready to do this yourself. This right link on the right here is my link to my Instagram. Very random, right? Just Instagram. But I share a lot on my social medias about what I do, about how I'm buying real estate, my deals I'm doing, how I'm doing it through policies. Uh, I talk a lot about it. If Instagram's not cool to you and you have Facebook, YouTube, LinkedIn, whatever it is, you can follow me at Carson.Herlene. That's it. Super easy. Just my first and last name. If you have kids you want to teach this to who are in their 20s as well, and you want them to start building the right foundation, which is probably a lot of you, click that link or, or, or uh, scan the QR code, find my Instagram, send that to your kids, have them DM me, tell them that they heard from their parents that were on a webinar with me, that they want to learn about how they can become their own bank. Guys, this is not just for you to learn and build off of. This is to build generational wealth for your family. Teach this to others. Share this with others. Share this presentation with others. This is not something we take lightly. This is a very big deal, and this will change your life as it has mine. I'm not here to sell you anything, really. I mean, I just want to share with you the value I've gained from practicing this, and I hope you guys can implement the same stuff I've been doing. So I'm sure there are a billion questions to finish out all of this today. So let's do it. Questions. First one coming through. I see it now. Let's give it a second. Let a couple more come in. Uh, there was about 10 of you who said me when I said, do you think you can see yourself doing this? Those 10 of you should be, but should be on my calendar right now. Carson.beyourownbanker.com. Fill that in. Set up time to meet with me. I, I opened up my calendar all week to meet with you whenever you guys can. I want to help you do this. All of you who can see yourself possibly doing this, schedule time to meet with me. I don't know if you can implement this or if it's something you even get 100% do. So we need to discuss it. All right. Questions. What if you could only afford to put $100 or $200 a month into a policy? Fantastic question. Let's start with it. And actually, you know what? Carson.beyourownbanker.com. I just threw it in the chat. There you go. That's the that's the link. I'll leave the, the QR code up here for a little bit if you guys would like. So if you could only afford and save $100 a month, then you are not in a position to, I would think, to really build wealth yet. You need to save money. Saving money is the number one goal if you're not yet. So a number I gave earlier that could be a good goal or marker to hit is 10 times your age a month. Say you're 40, 400 bucks a month, 50, 500 bucks a month. You should try and get to that level first. Once you can save that consistently, Great. Now you know I can do this, I can save this, and I'm in a good spot to then move forward. Now that you have that money you can save, how can you save it more efficiently? That would be the policy. So then we'd, we'd set up a policy at that point. Um, great question to start. Can you co-mingle funds from a 1035 and savings? Those of you who do not, do not know, a 1035 exchange is when you exchange a current policy over to another policy, like an IUL, for example, or a VUL, or another whole life into a different type of, of permanent life insurance, just like a 1031 exchange with, you know, rolling over real estate properties, same type of idea. And so, yes, you can do a combination of doing a 1035 and funding it from outside sources. Uh, which insurance companies underwrite? How long in business? So we work with five or six different mutually owned insurance companies. They've all been around for over a hundred plus years, every single one of them. They've all paid a dividend every single year they've been in business. They're all very strong insurance companies. They're all A plus or higher. Companies like Guardian, companies like One America, Lafayette Life, Mass Mutual, Security Mutual Life, 
Penn Mutual, all of these companies would fit that mold. But if you were to go to an agent at those companies and say, hey, I want to be my own bank, they would either have no idea what you're talking about, or they would say, oh, yeah, sure, here's an IUL that has no cash value for five years. And they'd sell you some random policy just to get some business from you. You cannot go to some random agent and ask for this. It has to be someone who is qualified and certified and does this specifically, which is our team. Someone said, can you take a loan against the house using equity? That is a whole other concept. 100%, that's called a HELOC, home equity line of credit. You can get a, a line of credit against your house whenever you want, as long as you qualify with the bank. But that is completely different than what we're talking about today. If your question is, do you want to get a HELOC to then fund life insurance? That is a very great question. Definitely possible. May make sense, may not, depending on the rates and what you're planning to do with the funds. Someone said, how much do you initially have to have to start? Zero. You do not have to have a dollar to your name. Well, that's not necessarily true. You don't need to start the policy off with some down payment or lump sum. You have the option to if you'd like to, but you do not certainly don't have to. You could just start funding it on a monthly basis if you desired. Can you put your 401k into the policy? Yes, you can. I mean, you'd have to pull it out of the 401k and then put it in a policy. But yeah, you could roll over. You could withdraw funds and then move it over 100%. Foresters, someone said, Foresters is an insurance company. We do not work with them. They don't do policies like this. Can you fund a policy through a self-directed IRA? Same answer as a 401k. If you felt it made sense to withdraw it from your, you know, withdraw it from your 401k, 403b, IRA, SEP. If you want to withdraw it from the qualified money space to fund a policy, you 100% can. Let's see what other questions we got here. Can we get the link for this recording? It will be posted online. Carson.beyourownbanker.com is the link if you'd like to schedule time to book with me. Someone said, what's the main difference between whole life insurance and indexed universal life insurance and IUL? We can go down the rabbit hole. There's so many ways we can dive into this. But the, the short answer is IUL or VUL or UL, those type of insurance products are variable. Up and down, down and up, the insurance company controls how much they pay you in dividends, how much the loan interests are. You don't have any control over what happens in the policy. But we're trying to build a foundation to control our money. So why would we use that? That makes no sense. Whole life insurance is fixed, guaranteed, set forever. So it's a much more predictable, safe, risk-free environment to store our foundation and where our money flows through. IULs also have rising costs over time, whereas whole life is fixed again. So IULs will get worse the older you get, whereas whole life will get better the older you get. So how would you also pick this as the foundation where you would know what gets worse the older you get? That makes no sense. So we could show you policy to policy, show you examples, but we would never use any type of universal life policy to do banking. Guys, we, we pumped this out. We did this quick, a lot of great questions. I, I, I'm good to go. Unless you guys have any other questions you want to hit. If you'd like to have a conversation, if you'd like to just get more video sent to you, shoot me a text or, or here's my phone number I'm putting in the chat right now. If you just want some more resources sent to you, text me. I'll send you 100 videos and books and everything to read and watch. Just shoot me a text with your name and I'll send you everything you need. The link to me with me is there. My email is in here. Anything you guys need, let us know. This replay will be posted online for you to share with your friends and family, coworkers, you know, whatever, anyone. Michael said, so you have to be able to pay 500 bucks a month at least. No, 10 times your age a month. Julie crushed it. Thanks for the response. Cool, guys. Good to go. Our team will be here next Tuesday along with our webinars tomorrow, Thursday, and next Monday we do webinars every single day. So please Keep joining, keep learning. The more you're around this campfire, our group, the more you're going to learn. Thank you, guys. I will see you soon. All right, so I hope you guys enjoyed that episode. We're putting up tons of them. But I think if you like this one, you'll probably like that video as well. Not only that, I've got a book that I created, Mapping Out the Millionaire Mystery, where we actually show you what the wealthy do in the game they play with money. I want you to have that for free. And if you want to know about all my new videos coming up, click that alert button. Actually, smash that alert button and you'll be notified every time we put a new video. So we'll see you on the next episode.